Hello everyone. It's lovely to see you all again uh, online. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the laboratory of the CNS pathology. And in the end of uh, this presentation, I'm going to talk briefly about the eye and the ear. I will point out the important points that you need to know so that you can survive the examination which will take place so soon. Ah, yeah, so what do you see from this image? So what change uh, do you see on this image? Do you see these cells? Yeah. They are so red. So what are the changes that we can, can observe in these cells? These cells are neurons. These cells are neurons. And what we can observe in these cells? Okay, we see pycnosis of the nucleus. We see eosinophilia of the cytoplasm pycnosis of the nucleus and eosinophilia of the cytoplasm. So this is anoxic neurons. Anoxic neurons are red neurons. These cells can be seen as uh, the earliest reliable sign for a reversible cell injury of the neurons. These cells can be seen in uh, ischemia of the brain or brain infarction. These cells are already dead even though they are still present here. So which area, which areas of the brain are prone to be affected by hypoxia or ischemia? Of course, the brain has a special property called selective vulnerability, right? And so for neurons, uh, the neurons in three areas are really prone to uh, hypoxic injury. The first one is hippocampus, hippocampus. The second one is the pyramidal cells in the cerebral cortex, right? And the third one is Purkinje cells uh, at the cerebellum, uh, 3P, right? Pyramidal cell layer, somnus sector, CA1 uh, of uh, hippocampus, pyramidal cells in the cerebral cortex, and Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. Okay, at, at least these three areas uh, you must uh, remember uh, because these three areas are prone to hypoxic injury of the brain. Uh, these cells function a lot. These cells require a lot of energy to survive. And oxygen is the key substrate for uh, the metabolism in the neurons. So without oxygen, neurons die. And this is another change. I think this change is so cute. Uh, so uh, normally, uh, neurons contain uh, nissel substance in their cytoplasm. But when there is axonal injury, maybe the cut of the axons, so the cell body will show this characteristics called central chromatolysis central chromatolysis so uh, because the axon is injured so the cell body is trying to repair itself so uh, it produces a lot of substance in the cytoplasm resulting in dissolving of the nissel substance so that's why we can see loss of nissel substance loss of pigment structures in the cell body. This is central chromatolysis. It is seen in uh, neurons with axonal injury. And 
here uh, is the change affecting the astrocytes. Normally, we will see astrocytes uh, without any cytoplasmic boundaries. Uh, we will see only the oval nuclei, pale, quite pale compared to oligodendrocytes. So, but when there is uh, injury to the brain, when there is a repair, so uh, these astrocytes are responsible for the repair process. So they will become hyperplastic and hypertrophic. Uh, so the hypertrophic astrocytes uh, will be seen like this one. Uh, the nucleus is eccentric at the one uh, one side of the cell, and we see cytoplasm is eosinophilic with uh, clearer cell boundaries. So we will see the boundary of the cells. So these cells are called gemistocytes. Gemistocytes. Uh, it is they, they are seen in uh, in uh, cryosis, cryosis proliferation of astrocytes as a result of brain injury. This figure demonstrates the change affecting astrocytes also. Uh, so what do we see in these astrocytes? So they have quite pale nuclei, quite pale nuclei without nuclear detail in the middle. Uh, this change is called Alzheimer type 2 astrocytes. These astrocytes are called as Alzheimer type 2 astrocytes. They are not seen in Alzheimer's disease, they are seen in Hepatic encephalopathy. Hepatic encephalopathy. And for the microglia, microglial cells are immune cells. So their function is to fight against uh, invaders, mainly viral organisms. So when the brain is infected by virus, the microglial cells uh, will uh, have elongated nuclei like this, which these cells are called rod cells, rod cells. And these rod cells will aggregate together to form a nodule called microglial nodule, microglial nodule. So the, the microglial nodule is seen in viral encephalitis viral encephalitis and so now let's move to the next topic about congenital anomalies and here is uh, pub is probably the most fearful one very toxic to uh, the mother uh, so because all pregnant women expect to have cute babies but when their babies come out like this, that is really uh, uh, psychologically toxic. So here we see, without the brain, without the skull, actually uh, the pa this patient still has uh, an, a little amount of brain here. So anyway, this condition is not compatible with life. So it is called an encephaly. It is an exam example of neural tube defect. Neural tube defect. So neural tube defect uh, results from abnormal or incomplete formation of neural tube, or maybe reopening of the neural tube. So uh, that is a problem. So the problems uh, are usually seen at the anterior neural pore or posterior neural pore because the zipping, the uh, uh, neural tube formation uh, takes place first at the cervical area and then migrating uh, to the distal part. So leaving the anterior pore and posterior opal, posterior pore open. So if the anterior pore is not closed, so the patient may have an encephaly or maybe uh, partially closed, uh, the patient may have uh, 
meningo omphalocele for example and uh, this top part some people some patients may have uh, meningo myelocele or which uh, the mildest form of which is spina bifida so these are together called neural tube defect neural tube defect and they share a common cause which is folate deficiency folate deficiency so without folate the neural tube cannot be formed properly so folate deficiency is the major risk factor for this condition and the tu uh, not tumor it is a biomarker for this condition is elevated alpha fetoprotein levels in the blood in mother's blood uh. and here is another other two uh, congenital, congenital anomalies affecting forebrain for affecting the forebrain so on the left side it is holoprosencephaly so the two sides of the brain uh, are combined right and left no right no left they all both of them are fused together holoprosencephaly and another example is the absence the agenesis of corpus callosum without corpus callosum so the right brain the right cerebrum left cerebrum cannot connect to each other so uh, the patients may have uh, uh, intellectual problem may have low iq zizer something like that and so what do you observe on this slide the brain is very atrophic the brain is very atrophic how do we know that it is atrophic we see narrowing of the gyri and widening of the sulci widening of the sulci narrowing of the gyri this is atrophy and diffuse severe brain atrophy is a typical finding in patients with alzheimer's disease alzheimer disease and if we look inside we may see enlargement of ventricular spaces ventricular system so this condition is called hydrocephalus ex vacuo hydrocephalus ex vacuo hydrocephalus hydrocephalus that is caused by a loss of brain mass uh, atrophy of the brain so they, these two are common cross findings for alzheimer's disease and if we talk about alzheimer's disease we need to mention two important uh, uh, lesions uh, typically seen in the Alzheimer's disease one uh, the first one is neuritic plaque neuritic plaque or Sinai plaque as we see here these are neuritic plaque or Sinai plaque so what protein uh, is aggregated here the protein is amyloid beta amyloid beta neuritic plaque is composed of amyloid beta deposition or uh, aggregation okay. but not only amyloid beta actually uh, the neurites that are abnormal uh, are still entrapped here but if, we, I, if i ask what protein is he in here that is amyloid beta so the first one neuritic plaque amyloid beta so here is a silver stain so uh, this demonstrates that the neuritic plaque is composed of not only amyloid beta but also abnormal neurites abnormal neurites these lesions can uh, 
also be seen in the elderly people, but not so many, not so many. But in Alzheimer's disease, these lesions are plenty. And we expect to see a lot of C9 plaques in those with Down syndrome because they have an extra uh, chromosome, chromosome the 21st, 21st trisomy 21. So an amyloid precursor protein, which is a normal protein in neurons, are uh, encoded by the gene in chromosome 21. So when the patients have an extra chromosome 21, uh, the patients have a lot of amyloid precursor protein. And when the amyloid precursor protein becomes abnormal, having abnormal conformation, becoming beta pleated sheet, so uh, the protein is transformed into amyloid beta amyloid beta and that is the abnormal protein that aggregates here in the neuritic plaque the enzyme responsible for uh, formation of these lesions is secretase normal secretase will have a uh, soluble products but abnormal maybe uh, not unusual pathway uh, of secretase activity uh, results in uh, aggregation, uh, results in aggregable uh, protein and the aggregated proteins are, is called uh, amyloid beta. So just remember neuretic plaque, C9 plaque, amyloid beta. And the second lesion here we see in the cytoplasm of the neuron, we see aggregation of some protein. So the lesion here, we see something aggregates here, something weaves whip, together, something like that. Uh, so this is neurofibrillary tangle. Neurofibrillary tangle. So what? is the component of neurofibrillary tangle that is tau t a u t a u normally tau tau functions as a microtubule binding protein but when tau is uh, hyperphosphorylated the hyperphosphorylated tau aggregates in the cytoplasm like this and the lesion is called neurofibrillary tangle neurofibrillary tangle so again neuritic plaque is composed of amyloid beta neurofibrillary tangle is composed of hyperphosphorylated tau so because there is uh, accumulation of tau within the brain in alzheimer's disease alzheimer's disease is included in the big umbrella of uh, the disease called tauopathy tauopathy so the brain diseases associated with accumulation of tau tauopathy here is a brain mass uh, this one is from the museum at uh, my department in Pramukka College of Medicine. So the patients are usually uh, in the bitten edge range. So some may present with seizure or epilepsy. Some may present with stroke or hemorrhage. And then the lesion is shown here we see uh, dilated blood vessels, dilated blood vessels, uh, and the dilated blood vessels aggregate in this area to form a mass, and this one seems to be hemorrhagic mass. So the spaces are filled with blood, filled with blood, because these channels, these uh, spaces are vascular spaces. 
And so microscopically, we see uh, taught to us abnormally, abnormally dilated blood vessels. We see worm-like, W-O-R-M, just like worm, worm-like blood vessels uh, aggregated here. So this is AVM, arteriovenous malformation, arteriovenous malformation. Arteriovenous uh, Venous malformation is caused by abnormal connection between artery and vein without capillaries uh, in between. Normally, the blood from the artery will enter capillary first and then the blood drains into veins. But this lesion is formed as a result of abnormal connection between artery and vein. So vein is not designed to, uh, to, to bear the high pressure blood. So to carry the high pressure blood. So the blood vessel valve of the venous side uh, will become uh, dilated. So the vein, veins will become dilated, dilated and becomes tortured. So that's why we see the lesion like this arteriovenous malformation arteriovenous malformation now let's uh, move to the brain tumor topic so brain tumors are very unique in many ways so just uh, leave you in the lecture <clears throat> Here, I would like to demonstrate one tumor that I think you must know. Uh, this tumor is very aggressive. It is classified as grade 4, WHO grade 4. So now, uh, do you know it already? This is cryoblastoma. cryoblastoma. Previously, it, is, it was called cryoblastoma multiforme. But nowadays, we just call it glioblastoma, glioblastoma. And do you remember all the four criteria for making the diagnosis of glioblastoma? Amen. Amen. A, atypia or anaplasia. M, <coughs> sorry, mitosis. E, endothelial vascular proliferation and necrosis we must say all these for changes in the tumor in order to make the diagnosis of glioblastoma which is grade 4 who grade 4 so here yeah, in this picture what do you see of course this is at low magnification so i don't think you should see any uh and uh, it's difficult to see atypia or naplasia but at least we see this vascular proliferation vascular endothelial m e m a m e n right e stands for endothelial proliferation because the tumor grows very fast so uh, the the areas that do not have enough blood supply uh, will have uh, will have the activation of VEGF VEGF vascular endothelial growth factor and these factors stimulate vascular proliferation. That's why we can see the uh, vascular proliferation within the lesion. According to the definition we require to see more than two cell layers uh, in order to make the diagnosis of vascular endothelial proliferation. So endothelial must be stratified instead of a simple columnar epithelium, right? So here we see the, endoth the capillary wall is so thick uh, with many layers of endothelial cells. This is vascular endothelial proliferation. And N, we see necrosis. Uh, necrosis may look like uh, snakes, so we call it serpentine, serpentine necrosis. 
and because the cells uh, surrounding the necrotic area uh, usually align uh, in row so we may call this necrosis pseudo palisading necrosis the cells seem to uh, be arranged be organized in row in a row so surrounding the necrotic area so that is pseudo palisading that is necrosis so that is pseudo palisading necrosis and at a higher magnification we can see that the cellular is cellularity is very high the cells are so dense close together we see that the cells show pleomorphism variation in cell size and shape or nuclear size and shape we see hyperchromatism the nucleus the nuclei are dark we see uh, uh that is all that is a atypia or anaplasia and then we have uh, the other criterion which is mitosis mitosis normally astrocytes are stable cells they are not expected uh, to divide in normal condition and here we see that these cells are abnormal and there are increased mitotic figures here is one here 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 oh so many mitotic figures so have we see all the four criteria for making the diagnosis of glioblastoma yes so this one is glioblastoma who grade 4 we see a atypia or anaplasia m mitosis e vascular endothelial proliferation N necrosis so fulfilling the criteria for making the diagnosis of glioblastoma here is uh, another figure demonstrating the necrotic area with pseudo palisading of the surrounding cells this is pseudo plus palisading necrosis glioblastoma this tumor is very bad is very bad even though the treatment has uh, um, advanced a lot but survival is still poor particularly uh, the de novo glioblastoma the, the glioblastoma that just just happened to be glioblastoma uh, glioblastoma may be classified to primary secondary but that's fine i think that is too much for you And here, so what do you see? These cells. Do you see fried eggs? Fried eggs. A lot of fried eggs, right? With a nuclear hero surrounding uh, the nucleus. Uh, nuclear. So this is oligodendroglioma. The tumor tends to have uh, small blood vessels proliferation within the mass to but that is fine i don't want to i i don't expect you to be able to make analysis on this one because maybe too difficult to see but one thing i would like to focus is that nowadays uh, we require molecular characteristics of the tumor in order to make the final diagnosis for many tumors for most of the tumors for glioblastoma of course it is diagnosed by uh, the histologic findings it can be diagnosed by histologic findings but uh, for the other types of glio uh, for of glioma we need molecular information for example even though these cells look really like oligodendrocytes because of the fried egg appearance but we cannot make the diagnosis of oligodendroglioma until we get the information that these cells have 1p19q correlation 1p19q correlation and here uh, the previous tumors are 
the intraaxial tumors they originate in the brain but now uh, this one is a different one this one is an extra axial uh, tumor so uh, this one uh, is also from the museum uh, at my department so we sh uh, have a skull here we have impression here so impression here uh, is caused by this mass this mass and if you look at this mass uh, it has a homogeneous cut section it uh, it is well circumscribed uh, and it pushes into the skull so we can guess uh, the location of the mass right so the mass should be just outside on the surface of the brain so it pushes uh, into the skull so this tumor is meningioma meningioma most meningiomas uh, are grade one who grade one they are very benign they are very benign but uh, there are also many tumors that are classified as grade 2 and grade 3 also so not all are really benign but however uh, location seems to be very important as well because benign meningioma can kill the patient if it uh, grows in the uh, brain stem in the vital areas in the brain for example and here i think uh, uh, this is from uh, the study set of from college of medicine so i think it is more beautiful than uh, and than, uh, the pictures in some textbooks so can you observe the worrying appearance of the tumors Cells, tumor cells very clear worrying 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 they are forming worlds forming payumun payumun worlds okay. so there are some key words for meningiomas okay uh, here we see worrying pattern the whirling pattern of the tumor and the second one we see uh, syncytial growth syncytial syncytial means the cells are fused together so we cannot see the boundaries of tumor cells they are fused together they seem to share the same cytoplasm actually they have uh, cytoplasmic boundaries but we just cannot see them so here we see that first cell second cells third cells third cell we cannot see it the boundaries of these cells they are fused they look it look like it looks like that they are fused together synthetic growth and also a prominent feature of meningioma is samoma body or concentric calcification samoma body so if you uh, hear about samoma body just think about uh, three types of tumor in the body uh, okay of course the one that you must know uh, is in thyroid gland in the thyroid that uh, in papillary carcinoma papillary carcinoma in papillary carcinoma samoma body is also a characteristic and the second one is meningioma Yes, meningioma. Uh, in meningioma, samoma bodies can also be detected. And the third one, which I think is optional because it may be difficult, it's uh, serous carcinoma of the ovary. Serous carcinoma of the ovary. That uh, these three types of tumors uh, are just like the main ones that have samoma bodies. Meningioma. We have samoma bodies, we have synthetic growth, we have whirling pattern, that is meningioma. Patients are expected to have only one meningioma, only one is enough. But in some cases, there are multiple masses of meningioma. So if there are more than one meningioma in the body, in someone's body 
we need to investigate uh, the neurofibromatosis type 2 neurofibromatosis type 2 right because uh, multiple meningiomas is a characteristic of uh, neurofibromatosis type 2 which is something different from Tau syndrome right Tau syndrome is neurofibromatosis type 1 or von leckling hausen syndrome so but this one is type 2 type 2 type 2 is associated with meningioma is associated with bilateral schwannomas at the cp ankle cerebropontine ankle or bilateral uh, acoustic neuroma Here is another picture showing the synthetic growth and also whirring pattern. And sometimes we may observe intranuclear inclusion also, but that is fine. I think it is too much in detail. Okay. And now, uh, this one is not really a brain tumor. Uh, it originates in a nerve in a nerve in any nerve in any nerve any nerve that has schwann cells can have this type of tumor so schwannoma is the name schwannoma can be seen anywhere in the body can be seen in the skin can be seen anywhere that uh, the nerves go to and also in the brain, the typical location for this tumor is cerebellopontine ankle, right? Cerebellopontine ankle. And the nerve that uh, it affects is acoustic nerve, vestibulocochlear nerve, uh, usually vestibular branch. And so uh, just cranial nerve, the eighth, the eighth. Uh, so uh, this is common location, common origin for schwannoma. That is why it is called acoustic neuroma, acoustic neuroma, because it uh, loves to originate in the uh, cranial nerve, the eighth, uh, the uh, acoustic nerve. And microscopically, we see that there, just like the tumor is, separated not really separated there are two zones uh, within the tumor uh, they may just uh, integrate with each other but we can still see loose areas and dense areas hypocellular areas for example here in uh, the, uh, the cellularity is very low low cellular area and also high cellular, high cellular area, cellular area and hypocellular area, right? So the cellular area is called Antony A and hypocellular area is called Antony B. Antony A, Antony B. Antony A, Antony B. So uh, the zonation of the tumor, uh, Antony A, Antony B, uh, is characteristic of this tumor and within the Antony A the dense cellular area we may be able to observe verluque body verluque body uh, resulting from pulsating of uh, the tumor cells with uh, the position of eosinophilic material in between the rows so uh, this mass is called verluque body verluque body verluque body Verluque bodies are seen in Antony A or a highly cellular area of the tumor of schwannoma. So schwannoma actually uh, is classified as peripheral nerve sheath tumor, peripheral nerve sheath tumor, uh, which comprises schwannoma and neurofibroma. Both originate from Schwann cells. From Schwann cells. And here, I would like to demonstrate Verloque body, Verloque body, palisading of the tumor cells with a deposition of eosinophilic material in the middle, that is Verloque body. And uh, for 
diseases of the eye and the ear. Uh, there is no laboratory exam, but I just want to give you some review uh, for these uh, two organs uh, so that you can survive the exam, uh, which is coming soon. So what do you see? Do you see the yellow elevation, yellow elevated area in the uh, white eye, right? Uh, it is uh, usually seen in the uh, interpalpebral fissure, interpalpebral. Just like if we say the patient to just open the eyes normally, uh, this area is the interpalpebral pressure, the, uh, the fissure between the upper lid and lower lid. So this area is exposed to UV light, right? So this one, the name is Pinque Kula. Pinque Kula. The plural is Pinque Tule. Pinque Tule. Pinque Kula. Pinque Kule. The, the name is weird, right? Okay. But it is the name Pinque Kula. Tolom. Tolom. The cause is UV. The UV degrades the protein here in the white eye in the conjunct uh, chiva. So uh, there is a, a connective tissue. Uh, will become uh, degenerated, uh, degraded, and then we see the lesion as uh, white, yellow, yellow white elevation uh, in the white eye. So, tolum. So, the treatment is not necessary, not necessary, not not necessary to treat for this lesion, but we need to prevent its progression into Paterigium, terigium. So the prevention means is to avoid exposure to UV light, to ask the patients to buy a, a, an expensive, maybe Ray-Ban uh, sunglasses when they have to go out uh, in a sunny day. So the cheap sunglasses are useless because they cannot screen, they cannot screen out the UV light. They just cause everything dark, but they do not screen out the UV light. We need to buy a proper sunglasses. We need to ask the patients to uh, buy some and then uh, wear them when they have to go out in a sunny day. This is Pinquecula. The cause is uh, UV light. The prevention is avoid exposure to UV light. It is totally benign, no need to treat. And when tolum is so severe, it may progress to tonia. When the, uh, the, the, the mass uh, grows through the limbus into the black eye, into the black eye, that is Pterygium, pterygium, p t e r y g i u m, pterygium. This one is also not so dangerous, but it may cause cosmetic concerns. Cosmetic concerns. So, uh, if the patients are well, they just don't care, just leave it. We may just uh, give them uh, antihistamine, hista op to release the irritation symptoms uh, because in both pinquecula and pterygium uh, the patients will have uh, irritation eye irritation uh, so the symptoms are mine just give them symptomatic uh, drugs that is fine but if <coughs> if the lesion interferes with eyesight with seeing uh, if uh, it grows into uh, the pupil uh, so uh, just like it may interfere with uh, patients seeing so that may, is another indication to remove the lesion and the removal is just a simple process just uh, remove it and the patients will be happy. Uh, that's all. So again, so the most important suggestion is that patients avoid exposure to UV light.
and here another uh, addition of the eyelid the inflammation of the eyelid is called blepharitis and when there is blepharitis or when anything that obstructs the opening of glands of mole or glands of seas uh, the patients may have abscess here and if the head is outside uh, it is a result of obstruction of glands of seas and more if the head is inside uh, the lesion is caused by obstruction of meibomian glands and maybe accessory uh, uh, like primal glands something uh, there so these abscess lesions are called hordiolum 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 the head is outside it is external hardiolum the head is inside that is internal hardiolum so uh, the organisms are quite the same just uh, those that are seen on the skin so if uh, for external hardiolum we have another nickname style da kung ying da kung ying so the treatment is also simple just drain the pus and then the patients will be healed and the patients will uh, have eye pain eyelid pain it is not associated with uh, looking at someone taking a bath do, uh, do pick up nam. that is not a cause of this lesion but a uh, decision is caused is caused by anything maybe the dust or blood varieties uh, that results in uh, obstruction of the opening of glands of disease or mold for external hordeolum and meibomian gland for uh, internal hordeolum. And hordeolum is a, an acute condition, so the patients will have eye pain. But here, the patients will complain of eye mass, usually at the lower eyelid with chronic mass chronic mass uh, so this lesion uh, when biopsied uh, is composed of lipogranuloma lipogranuloma that is rupture of sebaceous glands here and then fat uh, comes out and then there is granulomatous inflammation uh, uh, which is reaction against foreign body uh, surrounding the lead uh, fat content so we see lipogranuloma lipogranuloma is the keyword for khalazian khalazian c h a l a z i o n khalazian this is khalazian lipogranulomatous inflammation and here is uh, the may perhaps the most important sign of glaucoma in glaucoma uh, we see uh, the cupping of optic disc cupping of optic disc or incre increased uh, cup to disc ratio optic cup is the inner circle the optic disc is the outer circle uh, normally this uh, cup to disc ratio should not exceed 0 0.4 or 0.5 but here we see that cup is very big so the glaucoma is characterized by the visual field defect visual field defect and uh, increased intraocular pressure is only another uh, feature that can be seen in glaucoma but normal glaucoma is also normal pressure glaucoma uh, is also another entity so uh, glaucoma uh, may have normal intraocular pressure or high ocular pressure but the most important finding is cupping of the optic disc uh, of cupping cupping increase cup to disc ratio cup to disc ratio cupping of optic nerve optic nerve 
and here what do you see okay the disk looks quite okay but see we see uh, blood vessel proliferation the blood vessels proliferate a lot with uh, hemorrhage with many uh, changes in the retina so this one represents the proliferative diabetic retinopathy diabetic retinopathy can be divided into two stages uh, background dr and proliferative dr so the cut point between these two stages is the inner limiting membrane of the retina if the if there is a neovascular membrane breaching the inner or internal limiting membrane that is the stage of proliferative diabetic retinopathy so the cutting point is in the limiting membrane if there is that new but new blood vessel growth uh, that breaks the inner limiting membrane uh, into the posterior hyaloid forming higher uh, uh, neovascular membrane on the surface of the retina that is proliferative diabetic retinopathy so here we see blood vessels coming out from the retina uh, into uh, so this is diabetic proliferative diabetic retinopathy retinopathy and here we see that the optic disc is swollen optic disc is swollen with engorgement of blood vessels this is papilledema papilledema it is very important that you can make the diagnosis of papilledema because the patients may have something bad inside of their head this is a sign of increased intracranial pressure increased intracranial pressure so because the optic disc uh, optic nerve is surrounded by csf and when there is increased intracranial pressure the optic nerve is uh, squeezed like it's pushed by the increased pressure of the csf so uh, there is swelling of the optic disc and there is engorgement of the uh, blood vessels when we look at the eye using fundoscope this is papilledema it is a sign of chronic increased intracranial pressure uh, if the lesion starts to grow for a few days we will not see this one if the lesion uh, grows quick uh, grows long enough maybe three or four days then we start to see papilledema papilledema so that's why the patients with increased intracranial pressure may have blurred vision this is a cause of blurred vision in uh, people with increased intracranial pressure and if you see a tumor in the eye if the edge is in the adult range that is melanoma melanoma so and if you see any black mass in the body just suspect that it may be melanoma it arises from uvia uvia so the cells are highly anaplastic and uh, cells produce melanin pigment so this is melanoma of the eye in contrast if there is a mass but seen in a child maybe a newborn a, an infant something like that just expect that that should not be melanoma that should be retinoblastoma for example for this uh, child for this uh, in for this child uh, we just use uh, a torch to 
uh, shine into the the eyes and then we see that on his left eye no light reflection no light reflection leukochoria this is a specific term but that is why i think too much for you leukochoria so this is a sign of retinoblastoma yeah it's the mass arising from the retina retinoblastoma and we expect to see small blue round cell we can observe homorite pseudorosid which is not specific and we can observe flexner winter stainer rosette this is true rosette with alumen uh, inside this is uh, the sign that the tumor cells are trying to form a photoreceptor so we can observe flexner winter stainer rosette small blue round cell uh, so let's move to the topic of the ear here on the left side we can see that the ear pinna is disfigured disfigured uh, this is caused by recurrent blunt trauma to the ear so it is commonly seen amongst boxers boxers the ear so the the blunt trauma of the ear pinna results in death of the tissue death of cartilage death of soft tissue and death is followed by healing right so the healing results in fibrosis and also this figure uh, of the shape of the ear pinna this is cauliflower cauliflower ear cauliflower ear another reason quite similar but different is heloid the heloid the typical very very typical location is at the back of ear lobe back of ear lobe so typical history is the patients have had uh, ear piercing before ear piercing before because uh, women love to be beautiful they love to wear beautiful earrings right but if uh if, if someone has just like genetic predisposition to have excessive repair excessive collagen deposition that person may develop keloid and then so this person does not have to buy earrings anymore because she has his her own earring all the time keloid uh, microscopically we will see the position of collagen we see uh, it is called keloidal bands keloidal bands uh, eosinophilic collagenous material uh, depositing in the in the dermis in the uh, connective tissue keloid so genetic factor is important and if we look at the ear and we look at the eardrum right eardrum normally we expect to see a cone of light right but here we don't see the cone at all and uh, the tympanic membrane seems to be bulging bulging and red so this is a sign of otitis media acute otitis media the predisposing factor for this one is impairment of drainage of eustachian tube eustachian tube so the eustachian tube is obstructed and then uh, it, uh, the, the, the lost bacteria cannot be removed uh, from the middle ear so the patients will develop otitis media ear pain conductive healing loss right on tip uh, uh, the, the Thai name for this one is hu nam no if untreated uh, the ear drum tympanic membrane may perforate may perforate so perforation is a complication of otitis media and the perforated hole is usually healed uh, very well healed very well if the infection is removed And here in chronic otitis media, 
one fearful complication is in growth of the squamous epithelium into the middle ear and the squamous epithelium just produces carotene material the carotene material may form a mass uh, this pearly white mass pearl anyamani now pearl kaibu pearly white mass which is called cholesteatoma cholesteatoma this one is not just like it looks beautiful but it is very bad so it can erode the 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 ossicles uh the contangon malias uh, incastapes causing permanent conductive healing loss and for the topic of the ear i would like you to focus on uh, the winne and weber test so i expect you to be able to distinguish between conductive healing loss and uh, sensory neural healing loss if the lesion is within the external ear or the middle ear for example uh, extreme malignant otitis externa uh, otitis media or otosclerosis uh, something or impacted ear uh, wax ear wax something like that uh, these conditions will cause conductive healing loss and what do we expect to see for Weber tests for example if I have conductive healing loss on the right ear the Weber test will show that the sound uh, is lateralized to the diseased ear because uh, on the right ear I cannot hear any background noise I do not have a masking effect of the background noise so the Weber test, we put a, a tuning fork on the forehead like this, right? And I will hear it louder on the right ear where I have uh, the problem. Uh, and what about Rinne? Rinne test, we just put the put tuning fork uh, at the mastoid process, uh, which will produce bone conduction, real bone conduction. So on the right side i have problem with the external or middle ear right so connective conduct uh bone conduction is okay is okay but when uh, i move the tuning fork to uh beside the ear i will not hear anything or the hearing is totally impaired whereas on the normal side uh, when i stop hearing uh, uh by the bone conduction and the tuning fork is moved to beside the ear i will still hear the sound because normally we have air conduction better than bone conduction air conduction has been amplified by uh, in casmalias therapies amplified by different processes so for linear test i will say that on the deceased ear i will have bone conduction better than air conduction that is conductive healing loss but for sensory neural healing loss when i do weber test i will hear in the normal side normal ear better than the abnormal ear for linear test air conduction is still better than bone conduction so i hope that i have not confused you even more but i just want to focus that for conductive healing loss such as in patients with otitis media autosclerosis or impacted uh, ear wax or maybe severe otitis externa or so impacted foreign body something within the middle ear and the external ear that is conductive healing loss if the problem is with the inner ear for example menia disease labyrinthitis or even uh, in the uh, schwannoma acoustic neuroma uh, the patients will suffer sensory neural healing loss uh, uh, the, uh, the problem with the inner ear and the acoustic nerve or the brain uh, these are uh, sensory neural healing loss so i hope you uh, this review is uh, helpful 
for you uh, to be prepared for the exam that is coming soon. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me directly uh, via email or uh, my line, uh, the live account. So uh, God bless you all. Bye bye.